Thank you for joining us for our presentation entitled On the Road to Net Zero. The first 51.5% is easy, the rest is up to you by Green Earth Global. We believe that our revolution mill has a potential to be one of the most impactful clean tech technologies that can be used by the mining industry. I'd like to start by thanking Unearth Solutions for hosting the Startups Unearth Challenge and the selection committee for choosing us to be a finalist. I'd also like to thank the conference organizers, as I can only imagine how hard it must have been to arrange a conference during the current disruptions caused by COVID. I'd also like to thank the judges for their consideration, and I hope that they give us a better score than these guys. To help tackle global warming, the mining industry is taking bold strides to address greenhouse gas emissions. For example, the ICMM have announced that their members have committed to the goal of net zero for both Scope 1 and Scope 2 greenhouse gas emissions by the year 2050 or sooner. Australia is well represented within the ICMM membership and Australia is also the location of many projects from ICMM com companies that are headquartered in other countries. In addition to the ICMM, there are other com mining companies that are in their own way following the intent of this initiative. So, moving forward, this mandate will have a massive impact on how mining companies view projects globally. So what are Scope 1 and 2 emissions? In simple terms, Scope 1 emissions are those directly generated on site, mostly from diesel-powered haul trucks, or possibly on-site electricity generation by burning gas or diesel in those locations not served by grid power. Scope 2 emissions are indirect emissions from the generation of electricity purchased from the grid, and used to run the processing plant. The largest consumer of electrical energy on site is the comminution circuit. To reduce greenhouse gases associated with scope one emissions, there have been great advances in alternatives to diesel power trucks. Trolley assist has been around for a while and EV haul trucks are now being developed. However, reducing scope one emissions in this way potentially leads to an increase in scope two emissions. Carbon capture to remove CO2 from the atmosphere could be used to offset scope 1 emissions. However, this is fairly new technology. To reduce scope 2 emissions, the most obvious option would be to generate renewable energy on site. Typically, this could be a combination of both wind turbines and solar panels combined with an energy storage system. As mentioned earlier, the largest consumer of electrical energy is in the comminution circuit which offers the largest single area to make energy improvements. The Natural Resources of Canada website states that it is estimated that 3% of the electricity generated worldwide is consumed within comminution circuits. Valentine, Powell and Tang's 2012 paper stated that comminution accounts for 52% of the electrical energy of a typical mine. In speaking with engineers, they advise it could actually be higher than 52%, suggesting maybe up to 60 or 70%. I'll stick with 52% for our purposes. The most common comminution circuit is typically a sag mill and ball mill combination. These massive slow tumblers contain ore, grinding media and water and often weigh hundreds of tons. Keeping this massive weight turning requires huge drive motors which are often rated in the double digit megawatts. More recently, high pressure grinding rolls are being considered. They require less energy than a sag mill However, they do have a higher capex cost. I'd now like to introduce you to the revolution, which uses a totally different method of comminution, one that draws inspiration for one of Mother Nature's most powerful and destructive forces. The revolution creates a series of vortices that act like tornadoes within its chamber. You can see from this photo that tornadoes are powerful enough to pick up semi-truck trailers. These typically weigh around six to seven tons empty. The Revolution is a vertical gyroscopic mill. It has a single shaft that acts as a flywheel. Attached to the shaft are the anvil blades that can be adjusted to create up to 26 vortices and pull up to 80,000 CFM through the unit. There are three segmented milling zones where the material must be a certain size before it can move to the next chamber. While passing through the mill, the ore material is subjected to a number of different milling actions upon the ore, including high speed material on material collisions at speeds up to over 700 kilometers an hour. As the material passes from one vortex to the next, it's also subjected to rapid 180 degree changes in directions and dramatic pressure differences. 
The material is essentially torn apart where it shears along the weakest grain boundary layers within the material. This allows the metals within the rock to be completely liberated or totally exposed on the surface, thus producing a higher metal content in the concentrate. You can see in the corner our logo is a gold nugget with the rock around it coming away and the gold nugget completely liberated. The degree of milling is fully adjustable and can go down as fine as 45 microns and it does so in a single pass, taking only 2.86 seconds. There's no grinding media or carrier water required. After being electrically isolated, a clamshell door allows for easy access for maintenance within the unit. The internals of the Revolution are protected by AR400 plating, and as the material is suspended by air vortices, the wear in the chamber is actually minimal. Revolution is ready to accept and process material within 90 seconds of startup. And on a project, the item with the longest lead time is typically the milling equipment and is therefore the first item to be purchased. Revolution has a lead time measured in months, not years. Shipping to the Revolution to site is also easy as it will arrive partially assembled in a couple of standard 40 foot shipping containers. The Revolution is available in two sizes. 9 foot and 13 foot units. The revolution works by simply spinning air and it's the vortices created within the unit that suspend the, and mill the ore. The energy consumption to spin air is a tiny fraction of say sag mills and ball mills which typically have to turn hundreds of tons. This is why the revolution has an installed power of only 300 kilowatts on even the largest 13 foot unit. The throughput of the revolution is measured volumetrically with a max possible daily volume of 21,600 cubic meters of material for the 13 foot unit. Unlike sag mills and ball mills, the weight of the 13 foot unit is only 18 tons, so the foundation requirements are fairly minimal. Fitting within a 4 meter cube, the required footprint is also very small and compact. And as the material is air padded, the noise from the revolution is only 90 decibels, making it a lot more comfortable to be around when in operation. This is an installation at the US Army Corps of Engineers in Fort Hood, Texas. They had a huge pile of construction and demolition waste, mostly consisting of wood, concrete, rebar and rock. This material was recycled by milling and separating, with much of it then used as road base. The first photo shows the feed system, the second photo shows the revolution mill. Note how a simple steel frame foundation is required to support the unit. These are some photos of the typical feed material that was sent to the unit. You can see in general the material is fairly large. These photos show the same material after passing through the revolution. These are not photos showing multiple passes, rather the internal clearances had been adjusted between each photo to change the grind size. You can see the material in the first photo is around 25mm or so, the second around 15mm and the grind in the last photo is a lot finer with the material now say less than one millimeter. It's possible to mill down as fine as 45 microns if required. To allow us to review and compare the energy consumed by the revolution in a mining application, we're going to do a sort of case study. A paper entitled Efficiency, Economics, Energy and Emissions, Emerging Criteria for Comminution Circuit Decision Making by Daniel, Lane and McLean was presented at the 2010 International Mineral Processing Conference in Brisbane. A link to download this paper is shown at the bottom of the screen. This paper reviewed the combination circuit of three typical mine sites given names A, B and C, comparing sag mill ball mill against high pressure grinding roller ball mill circuit. We're going to add in the revolution, however we're going to look at just the numbers for a single site, mine A. The throughput is 1625 tonnes per hour using an ore density of 2.63 tonnes per cubic metre. The primary crusher clearances are set for 150 millimeters, and the desired output grind is a P80 of 106 microns. As the throughput of the revolution is based on a volumetric calculation, it is found that a single 13 foot revolution can handle this throughput and is running at just under 70% of max capacity. Only around 1.3 tons of material will be within the revolution at any given time. The data shown in the following tables has been extracted from the source paper. For readability, we have just included the data relevant to our presentation. You can see the SAG-B circuit requires 32.3 megawatts of installed power, 
or 19.9 kilowatt hours per tonne processed. This works out as an annual energy consumption of 258.7 gigawatt hours. The HPGR circuit requires 27.5 megawatts of installed power or 16.9 kilowatt hours per tonne processed. This works out as an annual energy consumption of 219.7 gigawatt hours, which is a potential saving of 15% over the SAG-B circuit. If we include the revolution in the comparison, you will see that only the, a single revolution is required to take the material from the primary crusher at 150 millimeters and reduce it down to 106 microns. We mentioned earlier that the revolution drive energy is used to spin air and the air vortices suspend and mill the ore. This means that the energy consumed is a fraction of conventional methods. The revolution consumes only 0.3 megawatts or 0.18 kilowatt hour per tonne processed, which works out at an uh, annual consumption of 2.34 of gigawatt hours. This is a saving of 256 gigawatt hours over the SAG mill ball mill combination a whopping 99% reduction in energy consumption. As power is only part of the OPEX equation, I've included the information from the paper relating to the annual operating cost comparison. Based on the annual throughput of 13 million tons per year, the annual operating cost of the SAG-B circuit is $37 million. The HBGR is $28.6 million per year, giving an annual saving of $8.58 million over the SAG-B. As previously mentioned, the revolution doesn't use a grinding media, and the liners see very little wear. The only wear items are the anvil blades that create the vortices. We have calculated an annual operating cost of $429,000. This is a saving of $36.75 million over that of the SAG-B. The ROI of the revolution based on OPEX alone can be measured in months. The title of our presentation says the first 51.5% is easy, the rest is up to you. So where does 51.5% come from? We mentioned earlier the comminution accounts for 52% of electrical energy used on a mine site and it could even be more depending on the flow sheet. If the revolution can save 99% of the comminution energy, then this is a 51.5% reduction of the total energy requirement for the processing plant. Based on the combination being 52% of mine site energy and applying this to the SAG-B circuit numbers, we've plotted the estimated electrical energy for the SAG-B, the HPGR and the revolution over 10 years. You can see the significant energy reduction over this time frame. This is a graphic pulled from the online Australian Mines Atlas and shows mines around Australia and Tasmania. This is a graphic showing known mineral deposits and this is a map showing the primary gas distribution pipelines and electrical transmission lines. Red is the gas lines and yellow is the electrical transmission lines. If we overlay the two maps you'll see the existing mines are clustered around the existing energy infrastructure. There are certainly mines in more remote regions and these are generally powered using diesel. Now overlapping the known deposits, you can see that there are many deposits much further away from existing energy infrastructure. It's probable that many remote projects were found to be unfeasible due to high energy requirements in the low remote location. Using the revolution, the energy required for processing plant is now half of that of conventional milling. This combined with the latest performance improvements and cost reductions in renewable energy systems make it now possible for projects previously found to be unfeasible to now be bankable. So what could you do with a 51.5% reduction in scope 2 energy requirements? Well, the size and cost of a building a renewable energy power plant would be significantly reduced. Also, it'd be far easier to ensure that there's sufficient energy stored through the night or for days with light winds. The savings in OPEX offered by the revolution would help pay for a renewable energy power plant. It will po be possible to use surplus energy to convert diesel trucks to trolley assist or EVs to reduce your scope 1 emissions. And the reduction in your carbon footprint would earn carbon credits. A lower cost of reduction would boost profits, improving shareholder value and stock price. As well as we discussed on the previous slide, it may be possible to advance previously unfeasible projects.
As the revolution can disassemble almost any material, it also has many applications outside of mining. In certain areas of the world, there's a shortage of the right type of sand used for construction. The revolution would be able to create large volumes of manufactured angular sand very efficiently from quarried rock. Beaches around the world, even in Australia, have undergone a process of beach nourishment where sand from another location is brought in, washed and deposited onto beaches that are being eroded. The revolution can easily process construction and demolition waste, asphalt and concrete, allowing these materials to be separated and reused. MSW going to the landfill can be processed such that the total volume is reduced, thus increasing the life of the landfill. Organics can take less time to compost if the material is broken down ahead of time. And the recycling of e-waste is key for our, our modern economy. Used ele consumer electronics contain significant volumes of precious metals and other valuable elements that can be recycled. As the world moves towards the circular economy, the revolution can help recycle a wide range of waste materials. In fact, recently, through a challenge run by Foresight Canada, the revolution was selected by Vestas as the winner of a challenge to help them recycle decommissioned wind turbine blades such that they can be recycled and reused for other purposes. In speaking with industry professionals, the common reaction is scepticism until they can see a unit running within a mine processing plant. However, I was told that once there's a successful mining installation, there most likely be a fistfight for the second unit. And I'm going to take this a step further and suggest that there's going to be a bar brawl for the third and future units. Thank you for your attention throughout our presentation. Please feel free to email either Nigel or myself for additional information. Nigel's email is nigel.psp at gmail.com. My email is george at pureworld.ca. You can also check out our website at www.greenearth.global. We look forward to hearing from you. Thank you so much.